All right, we've got a lot to cover tonight. Open up your Bibles to Judges chapter 4. I don't know about you guys, this has been an exciting book for me to study. I love being a narrative. I love walking through and seeing these stories. And there's just a realness and a rawness and honesty and a transparency to the book of Judges. And as we've been in it so far, we've seen what many call the sin cycle. It's like, you know, they're obeying the Lord, and then... um, You know, usually a leader in their life goes on, they transition into another season, they start to disobey. God brings pain and discipline into their life. They forget God. Um, And then they cry out to God, and God sends a leader. And we saw last week, we went through three leaders. Today, we're going to see two new leaders. Uh, And and today, actually, we're going to cover chapters four and chapters five. And you're like, that's a lot. It is a lot. Uh, We normally do a chapter. Today, we're going to do two chapters. And I'll I'll tell you why that is in just a moment. Uh, But let's start. Let's dive right in. There's a lot to cover with Judges chapter 4, verse 1. It says this, And the people of Israel again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. You're like, I'm tired of reading that. I'm tired of saying that. And it's like, yeah, I'm tired of the sin of my own life and the rebellion in my own life. And this is, there's a redundancy to it because we read it and we go, this is ridiculous. And then we realize, no, this is our life. So again, they did what was evil in the sight of the Lord after Ehud died. Remember, Ehud was that left-handed fellow that we read about last week. Uh, And the Lord sold them into the hand of Jabin. Now, this is interesting. We always see that sin leads to slavery. In fact, uh, the biblical word for addiction is slavery. Okay, And so what happens is these people end up in slavery. Uh, And Jabin, king of Canaan, who reigned in Hazar, the commander of his army was Sisera. Now, there's going to be a lot of different people tonight. So we're going to have to put our thinking caps on. There's a lot of different things happening. But Sisera uh, is the right-hand man, the army general of Jabin. So Jabin's the king. We don't see him a lot in this book uh, or in this chapter. For the most part, we end up seeing a guy named Sisera who basically carries out the vision and the mission uh, and the priorities of Jabin. So that's what we're going to end up seeing. So it says this. Um, Who lived in Heresheth. Verse 3. Then the people of Israel cried out to the Lord for help. So there's repentance. So again, you can see this cycle. For he had, this is Sisera and Jabin, for he had 900 chariots of iron and he oppressed the people cruelly for 20 years. What we we keep seeing is as the people fall into sin, it's deeper and it's darker and it lasts longer. This time they are not only in slavery, but they're oppressed, they're oppressed cruelly. And it's not for eight years or 18 years like last week, now it's for 20 years. And what's interesting, you read this and you go, who is this Jabin guy? Well, if you read the book of Joshua, Jabin, this is very interesting, because remember, we said that to understand the book of Judges, you have to view the land of Canaan as your life, and the enemies of God as the sin in your life. And here's what Jabin, here's who Jabin is. Jabin was a king that they were supposed to deal with in in Joshua chapter 11, and they ignored him, didn't deal with him, thought he would go away if they ignored him, and now he comes back into their life. It's like, well, is that our life story? Yes. We often think that what we need to do is, hey, if I ignore this thing, it will go away. It actually won't go away. Actually, what happens is when you ignore something, here's what we learn. This is the principle from scripture. When you ignore something, you don't deal with something. It doesn't go away. It just gets bigger and comes back stronger at you. I mean, think about it. For, you, know, you get a, your, your, you know, a tax bill from uh, the government. You go, oh, that's a silly little bill. I'm not going to pay that. You know, you go, I'm going to ignore that. What happens to that bill? It doesn't become smaller. It actually, over time, if you don't deal with it, uh, pretty soon they come after you like, oh, now I owe a lot more money than I did at the beginning because I didn't deal with things when I should. So this story, it, it's like this old enemy that comes back in that is bigger and stronger than it was before comes after them. And here's what you need to know. There's always a Jabin in your life. There's always something that if you are not worshiping the Lord, you're not seeking the Lord, it's going to come after you. It could be a bad relationship, Uh, it could be some sexual sin, it could be bitterness and resentment and deceitfulness. And so the the context of this whole two chapters is Jabin, an old enemy, coming back at them. Well, that's very interesting. Second thing you kind of need to know, kind of for a framework here, is that Judges chapter 4 and Judges chapter 5 are two chapters that recount the same events ultimately. Let me, let me explain this. So if you look at Judges chapter 4, just you can look at it real quick. It, it's the events that happen when these two judges named Deborah and Barak, we'll talk about them, when these two judges, they go to war against Sisera, and then there's going to be a girl at the end named Jael, and we'll talk about her as well. But So you've got this, this whole, all of the events, but then look at what the title, you know, a lot of the, our Bibles have titles for the chapters. The title for chapter 5 is the song of Deborah and Brock. Think of it as like a, you know, a Jay-Z and Beyonce were kind of singing about like what happened. That's what's happening. Chapter four is what happened. Uh, you know, and if you're older, it's Dolly Parton and Kenny Rogers. They're singing about what's happening. Okay. 
If you're like, I don't know who Jay-Z and Beyonce is, that's okay. Um, so so they're, they're singing about it, and this is important. You go, well, why is this important? Well, because in chapter four, we're going to have the events, and in chapter five, we're going to have the explanation of those events and what they mean for us. And, and that's the, this is very common in the Bible. For example, in, in uh, Exodus 14, you have Moses, and you have him going through the Red Sea, and you go, well, what was that all about? Now, we kind of know now because we have all this teaching, we have all this understanding, but you go, what was it about? Well, you'd have to go to Exodus 15 and listen to the song or read the song of Moses. What is, what is this Moses doing in, in Exodus 15? He's singing about the Red Sea and what it means for the people of God and what God was doing. Think about the, the book of Jonah. We studied it together as a church last year. Jo- or Jonah chapter one, Jonah's like running from God. He jumps, you know, get thrown overboard. He's eaten by a large fish. And then you get to chapter two, you go, he's writing a hymn in the belly of a fish? What's this about? Well, he's singing a song to interpret and explain and understand the events in his life. Well, this is actually how your whole New Testament is, is put together. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the gospels are the events of Jesus Christ, and the epistles are the explanation and interpretation of those events. Well, you go, well why is all this so important? Because we live our lives in Judges chapter four, and we often don't get to see Judges chapter five. Judges chapter four is like, well, why did this happen? Why did I end up at that school? Why do I have this job? Why did this suffering come into my life? And it's like, I don't fully know. And and sometimes we get Judges chapter five in the rear view mirror. We're like, okay, now I understand. Looking back, I understand why, what God was doing and what was happening in my life. Oftentimes Judges chapter five doesn't happen until we get to heaven. But you need to understand that's how this has worked out. So we're going to spend almost all our time tonight in Judges chapter four, and we'll dip in every once in a while to Judges chapter five. So Judges chapter four, now let's pick up in verse four. Here's what it says. In Judges chapter 4, verse 4, it says this, Now Deborah. All right, we got the first female judge, the only female judge. We're going to talk about her at length tonight, but here she is. Now Deborah, and she is a boss lady. Okay, write that down, boss lady. That's what she is. She's got a lot going on. Uh, she's got, we got at least four main things going on in her life, okay? She, nothing negative is said about her. I know a lot of Christian families, who they, like, they name their first daughter Debbie. Or Deborah, because it's like just she is one of the main and central women figures in the Old Testament who nothing negative said about her. Here, here is what it says. Now, Deborah, a prophetess. Now, there's not many of those in the Old Testament. You, you can find maybe five or six, depending on, on one or two kind of variables there. But, but about five or six women in the Old Testament are what would be called female prophets, and we'll talk about that. So she's got that going for us. Like, well, that's really great. And then she's the wife of Lapidoth, and we'll talk about that, but she's got something going on outside the home and something going on inside the home. Wow, that's amazing. You can do both. Okay, now she was judging Israel at that time, so now she's a judge. Basically, that, that one of the um, synonyms for judge is she's a leader. She's leading people. This is very interesting, but she's doing it a little bit. We'll get into some of the differences. She does it a little differently than some of the other judges. It says this. She's judging Israel at that time. She used to sit under the palm of Deborah. She gets her own tree. No other judge gets their own tree. Okay, pretty cool. Maybe a modern-day coffee shop. She had her own coffee shop. People came and went and talked to her. Okay. Um, between Ramam and Bethel in the hill country of Ephraim, and the people of Israel came up to her for judgment, so they wanted to see what she's going on. And then, this is interesting, now we get to see how she interacts with men. So we get, to, we get to hear a little bit about her husband, Lapidoth. And then she has an interaction with the other judge of the time, Barak. Okay, here's what it says. She sent and she summoned Barak. Like, hey, Barak, I got to tell you something. It's really important. Barak comes over. Yeah, what's, got, what's up? Uh, the son of Abedin in Kade- from Kadesh. And said to him, this is amazing. She brings God's word to him in a very personal way and challenges him with it. <clears throat> Has not the Lord, the God of Israel, commanded you? In other words, there's something God's told you to do that you're not doing. Go gather your men at Mount Tabor, not the high school. Different Mount Tabor. (laughs) Yeah, that high school's old, you know, no. Um, Taking 10,000 from the people of Naphtali and from the people of Zebulun, and I will draw out Sisera, there's Sisera again, the general of Jabin's army to meet you by the river Kishon and with his chariots and his troops, and I will give give him into your hand. So here's where we're going today. We're going to talk about two women and three men for the rest of our time. There's two women. In fact, this this is really interesting. This chapter is bookend by women. The first is a girl named Deborah. We just talked about her, a woman named Deborah. And she is a prophet, and she is a judge, and she is a wife. There's a couple other things said about it that we'll look at. And and that's the beginning of the book. And then the the, the end of uh, chapter four is Jael, and Jael Jael is a stay-at-home mom. It's interesting, we're going to see from the very beginning to the very end, God using two very different women in his mission. 
Now, here, here's what you need to know. God wants to use every man, every woman, and every child in his mission to reach every man, woman, and child. This is God's desire. And what we're going to see tonight is, um, is God begins to do this, and, and as God uses Deborah and as God uses Jael, they are strong women, uh, but what we're going to see with Deborah is she does not believe the two lies that our culture tells us today. So I believe there are two lies. That, that we're told today when it comes to gender and authority, manhood, womanhood, masculinity, femininity, male, female, however you want to write it down. I mean, and let's just be honest. We have to admit that we live in a, and I don't say this in a patronizing way at all, but we live in a very confused culture about gender. When you go on Facebook and there are 70 some options for gender, you're like, there's some confusion here, obviously. Um, and, and I'm not making light of this either, but when we're, in, we're having conversations about what bathroom we should use, we are confused and this is what happens. When you forget God, you don't know yourself. That's, that's actually what the Bible clearly teaches. And, and, and from Genesis chapter 1, we see that God makes men and women, male and female, man and woman, in his own image. And so, so here's the two lies. Lie number one that, that people tend to believe uh, about men and women. That men and women are exactly the same in every way. It's like, well, let me be clear. Men and women are more the same than different. But they're very different. And not just hair distribution and plumbing and tone of voice, okay? They're different in more ways than just that. Now, hold on. They're very similar, though. So here's some amazing similarities. Um, they are both made in God's image completely. They are both saved the exact same way by the cross of Christ. They are both sinful, broken, and fallen. They are both given all of the spiritual gifts. Uh, they're, they're, women don't get certain gifts, and then men get different gifts. They're all, they're, all the spiritual gifts are for both men and women. Um, they are both called to be a part of the Great Commission. Now, this is amazing. Think about it. Who is, in fact, who is the first person that finds out that the Son of God is going to come into the world? A woman, Mary. And who's the first people that get to go to the uh, resurrected tomb and see Jesus, even though they weren't considered legal witnesses in that day? Women. So they've always played a critical role. So <clears throat> the, the one lie that, that people believe is that they're exactly the same. And you know this as soon as you have kids. If you have kids, you know this. I know there are, 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 are occasional exceptions to this rule, but for the most part, and I know some of these are stereotypes, but they're stereotypes for a reason. It, you know, I, I have a son, and I have, and I have or two sons and a daughter, and, um, and they're very, very different. Okay, so my daughter and I, we go on daddy-daughter dates. And she likes to get dressed up, and she likes to eat expensive food, and, you know, and, we, and we do that, you know? Uh, and, and it's fun, and, we have, and that's daddy-daughter dates. Now, my sons and I, we go on dude development with dad. Okay, they all have, say they equal though, they all have three Ds, okay? So very equal but different, okay? Um, and they're very, very different. You know, my daughter likes to do tea parties and all this fun stuff, and, and my, my sons come in, even my almost three-year-old son comes in and says, Dad, there are bad guys in the other room, we have to kill them. Um, and I go in there, and there's not bad guys, but you know, it's biblical, so we go in there, and we shoot them, and, and so, you know, it's like there's this, you know, it's all fake, but you know, and so you just see these differences. So one, one lie is that, that, Men and women are the, exactly the same. And you go, oh, that's a lie. And then the, here's the other one, and this is even more pernicious, is that somehow one is more superior than the other. And, and we know this. Some is called, sometimes it's called chauvinism, where people think men are better. Sometimes it's called radical militant feminism, where um, women think they're better than men. And it's, it's interesting. In the UK right now, only 7% of women consider themselves feminist. Isn't that interesting? Because, and they did this research because that was really surprising, why do only 7% of women in the UK, which is so progressive, you know, consider them femi themselves feminists? And it was because of, of, of how ideological and agenda-driven that movement has become. Because really, so here's an interesting thing. This week in the Wall Street Journal, which by the way is not a Christian paper, okay? The Wall Street Journal, there was an article written by a woman named Erica Kosmer. And you can look up this article, and it's this week this happened. And she wrote an article, I'm so glad she did, because she's a psychotherapist, a woman, I don't think a Christian, she writes an article called Masculinity is Not a Sickness. And it was in response to the Gillette commercial. But more than that, because the Gillette commercial we could talk about all day and it's controversial and talks masculinity and all that kind of stuff. But what was interesting is she says in it, she says, I didn't know this, but the American uh, Psychological Association just diagnosed masculinity as a pathological state and evil that needs to be eradicated. So you go and you go, well, I wonder why men are depressed. I wonder why men go, what do I do with my aggression and, and my competitiveness and my desire to protect and my desire to compete? What do I do with these things? And so what's interesting is as the world's asking a question, the Bible has an answer. And when we are able to say, you know what, actually, men and women are equal in value, dignity, significance, and worth. It's a lot of things, a lot of really important things. 
Uh, but they're different in roles and responsibilities, and they're designed to work together. We'll get to this toward the end, but that's actually the story of Scripture and the story of human history is imperfectly and, yes, sinfully and brokenly and all that other kind of stuff, men and women working together for God's mission. We've seen that ever since Adam and Eve. It's like, yes, there was fall and there was, and they, you know, and there was all that, but at the end, what did they do? They left the garden together and they tried to figure things out together. And they had kids together. And Abraham and Sarah, what happened together? And Joseph and Mary, what happened? It's all together. And so let's pick up with Deborah because Deborah tells us how to be a woman in the world today. I think that you could look at Deborah, whether you're single or married, whether you have kids or you have no kids, um, and you could say, I think there are some principles here. I think there are some principles here that I could learn and I could live out, and I would want every woman in this room to go, that's what I would love to be, my own version of these things. And here's what the four things are. First, she was a woman who knew God's word and knew how to teach it to others. That's why she's called a prophetess. Uh, There is, I mean, I think this is true. I don't think there is anything more powerful than to know God's word and to be able to communicate it compellingly to somebody else. It's like that's that those types of people are always in short supply, always. I don't care if it's a man or woman, young or old. It's like somebody who could take God's word and say, it's integrated enough into my life. I'm trying to live it out. And I know enough of it because it's a lot. There's there's Genesis to Revelation. Okay, here's what this means. It means I'm, I'm studying systematic theology some. I'm trying to think about how the Bible goes together. Because what we're going to see in a few minutes with Deborah is people come to Deborah with their problems. That's what ministry is. Ministry is people coming to you with their problems. And the category of problems is not going away for you or for anyone in this room. And in fact, it only gets worse. And if you have more responsibility and more kids and more relationships and you get older, you have more problems. And that category is never going away. And so what do we need? Well, we need people who know God's word and can bring it to bear on different people's situations. This is why women are so critical and crucial in discipleship, in teaching, in discipling other women. Uh, The Great Commission is given to the entire church, both men and women. So the first thing we see is that she is a woman who knows God's word and is able to pass it on to others. The second thing we see, and this is maybe the most controversial in culture today, is that we see that she is a woman who relates uh, appropriately to authority. And, and, And some people think you can't do that. Some people think, I can't be a strong woman and honor God's design and order for, for how he talks about manhood and womanhood. That, that, that's, that's often a lot of people. If I can't be a really strong woman, it's like, well, I don't know if anyone in here thinks they're a stronger woman than Deborah, but she seems pretty strong. You know, and so as I read about her, here's what she does. We see two things. First, in verse four, it says that she is the wife of, wife of Lapidoth. Now, we're gonna talk about him in a few minutes. Don't worry, we're gonna get to the men. Everybody's going to be equally offended and equally comforted tonight, okay? Uh, equally offended and equally comforted. Um, and, and so, so Lapidoth, okay, so, this is very interesting because, and you can check this, there's nowhere in scripture where a man is introduced as the husband of somebody. So it doesn't say Barak, the husband of Michelle. Okay, it doesn't say that. It says, um, some of you got that, okay? Um, <laughs> a couple of you will get that on the way home. Um, so um, it doesn't say that. It always says the woman, it, it, if a woman is mentioned, uh, like, like uh, Deborah in this situation, it, it, it says something really important about her, very public, Um, about her, which is very, very good. And then it calls her the wife of Lapidoth, which means that somehow she was able to say, okay, God's given me a public ministry. God's given me a platform. God's given me skills. God's given me competencies uh, and capacities and and, and all of that. But at the same time, I honor my husband as the head of the home. That's the Bible's way to say that. And we're going to get to the guys in a second about why that's so important and the type of man that Lapidoth must have been for her to be able to do that and say that. So, but not only that, but she relates correctly to Brock. Now let's look what she says. If you go to verse six, here's what it says. She sent and summoned Brock, the son of Abinimum, from Kadesh and said to him, and this is amazing. So she goes to Brock, who is the first among equals uh, of the two judges. And you go, well, why are you saying that? Well, because later in 1 Samuel 12, when this time period's mentioned, only Barak is mentioned as the leader. And it's, it's not disrespectful to Deborah. It was just he was the first among equals. And if you're going to really quickly talk about an organization or time period, you normally just name one person the senior, senior leader. It's also why in Hebrews chapter 11, the hall of faith, um, when it goes, hey, I don't have enough time to talk about, he goes, I don't, if only time would allow me to talk about Barak. It's not that he wouldn't also talk about Deborah, but Barak is the first among equals in this situation. And in fact, it's interesting, Deborah treats him this way. She comes to him, and by the way, she's the only judge not to fight in a war. She says, that's not my place, but I'm going to go and I'm going to speak God's word. 
And here's what she does. She goes in privately, personally, and she says, Has not the Lord, the God of Israel, commanded you, go gather your men at Mount Tabor, taking 10,000 from the people of Naphtia and the people of Zebulun, and I will draw out Sisera, the general of Jabin's army, to meet you by the river of Kishon with his chariots, his troops, and I will give you Give him into your hand. Here's what she does. She goes to him, and she encourages him to be all that he could be according to God's word. It's like, that's amazing. That's the opposite of nagging. Nagging is, I'm going to tear you down and tell you all the ways you're failing. She didn't go to him and go, you're doing all these things wrong. Here's 10 more things you're doing wrong. You always do things wrong. You never do things right. She more says, so, you see how positive it is? She actually is so winsome. She asks it as a question. Do you see that? Hasn't God said that you should be the person to lead this? This is the difference between calling up and calling out. You know, and it's, it works both ways. Men need to do this to women, yes, and, and, but we're, we're picking on the women right now, okay, just for a moment. Uh, but women need to do this to men. And this is an incredibly powerful thing that someone can do. This happened to me just a few weeks ago. A friend of ours, uh, a family friend of ours, we were having this conversation, and, and it was very respectful, and, and she was very kind about it. And, and she, um, she said, you know, hey, pulled me aside and said, hey, you know, you know my husband really, really well. And you guys interact, you know, throughout the week, and you guys see each other at different times. And, and she said it very nicely, but she said, I really wish you would kind of engage him a little bit more in a few things and challenge him in a few areas. And, 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 and the way that you are when you're preaching, you're teaching, you're intense, and you're direct. And I, I just wish that you would, you know, do some of that with my husband because I think it would be, I mean, he's a great guy, and I'm excited about him. And she wasn't disrespectful about him either. She just said, I just think it could be really good for him. And I just walked away from that part of the conversation going, well, maybe I could be a little bit more. You know what I mean? That's kind of, well, I'm kind of like, I'm just like, I'm, I'm encouraged. I'm not discouraged. It wasn't you're the worst person ever. Da, da, da. It was actually, hey, here, I want to call you up into something. So, so this is amazing. We see Deborah, a strong woman, honoring her husband and honoring the spiritual authority in her life while flourishing and functioning. Now, some people go, well, what does this mean for a single woman? Um, Particularly, here's what it means. Do not, there's a lot of different things we can talk about today, but just for simplicity, do not date somebody that you don't respect. It's like, well, okay, you're like, well, you know, it would be very hard to, to you know, to follow a man and have him as a head of the house. It's like, it's very hard. I can't imagine. I'm sure it is, especially because we're all sinful. It's even harder if, if you marry somebody who all, all he has is potential, right? It's like, children have potential. That's what a child is. It's like, if you ever wonder, why do you think children are so cute? Because they have potential, because you don't know what they will become. You're like, this is so cute. He's 10. What would he be? You don't want to say that to a 30-year-old, you know? You want to be like, okay, I know what he's doing. I know what he believes. I, 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 you know, I know his job. I know his calling. And it's like, trust me, I'm sure it's hard to um, follow somebody even when you respect them, okay? And, and it's hard on the other end, we're going to get to the men, but it's hard to sacrifice and serve and, because you're sinful, you know? And you're not the greatest thing ever either. And it's like, it's hard together. And men and women, we try to work it out and we fail and we have a lot of conversations when we mess up. So she's teaching God's word. She's under authority. Third, she has an incredible, what appears to be a, the, the first, potentially one of the first, let's say it safely, one of the first counseling ministries in the Bible. Uh, in other words, she's the only judge that doesn't go out and preach to people, but the people come to her. Do you see that in verse five? She's sitting under a tree. They come to her. They ask her questions. This means that she was the type of woman that other women and men noticed and said, I could learn from her. You know, that, I mean, it, that's what a leader is, by the way. If, if you, there's an old proverb, not a biblical proverb, there's an old proverb that says, he who uh, thinks he leads and has no followers is only taking a walk. Okay, and so this idea that, uh, and so, in fact, if you've got to go, I'm a leader, it's like, you're definitely not a leader. <laughs> like, that's one thing you're definitely not. Um, what, what a leader is is somebody who people go, I would like to follow that person, or, or, you know, they went through a lot of suffering, and that's really, you know, how do they deal with that? Wow, they know the Bible well. You know, their kids seem normal and, and godly, and I'd like to learn how they did that. And, you know, and, and so you want to talk to them. And, and so what we see with her is, is that all good leaders are first good listeners. She's sitting under the tree. She's listening to their, um, to their questions. You know, and, and when you do that, that makes you a better teacher as well because you realize these are the questions that people have. In fact, the difference in, in why they're, they're really two different hands of the church, the reason for preaching and counseling is how they're connected. So with preaching, preaching, you start with the passage, and from the passage, you deal with people and their problems. And that's easier than counseling. Because it's like, well, I have my one passage, and here's what it is, and here's all the problems connected to it, and see you next week. <laughs> right? right? But, but what happens in counseling, in counseling, somebody brings you all of their problems. 
And then you're like, okay, now I have to start with people and their problems. And now you have to be very, this is what's so impressive about Deborah, and I have to be able to listen to them and give them answers to their problems. And sometimes it's really complex. They come to you and they're like, well, my marriage is terrible. And you're like, okay, well, tell me more. Well, and I'm also depressed, okay, well, and, you know, and my mom has dementia and is an alcoholic. You're like, oh, goodness, you know? It just is overwhelming. You're like, there's just so many problems, and then I don't know how to deal with all of them. And it's like, well, what's the answer to that? It's like, well, know the Bible better, know yourself better, grow up, repent of sin, talk to others. But what we begin to see here is that she, I mean, she's a really incredible woman. She's got a teaching ministry. She's got a counseling ministry. She's respecting authority. And then ch- look at chapter 5, verse 7. I told you they're connected. Chapter 5, verse 7 says this. At the very end of verse 7, she says that I, Deborah, arose as a mother in Israel. So she honors motherhood. This is, this is amazing. So she's, she honors the working woman who's got a skill set, who's outside the home, who's doing great things. It's awesome. And then she also honors moms. She says, okay, uh, I, and, and we don't know if she had biological children. Most likely she did. But she's not talking about her biological children here. She's looking at a group of people going, I want to be a mom to those people. Which means that you could be a single woman and you could be a mom to a group of people in one sense. That you could be, uh, you could be infertile and be a, a mom to people. You could have your own biological kids and decide, hey, I'm, gonna, I'm actually going to still, what does that mean? I'm going to care for and nurture and look after a group of people. Like, and I want to raise them up. I want to care for the next generation. And, and she honors, and this is important because I, don't, I, I can't tell whether our culture still honors mothers or not. I mean, Mother's Day is a big holiday and a lot of Hallmark cards go out and all that kind of stuff. But, but really, throughout the week, I, I feel like the way that women are talked about, it's like, well, you know what? It's like, you, you, sh- you, know, you, you should go get an education. You should be all you can be. It's like, you should. But sometimes what's forgotten is like, and being a mom is a great thing too, you know, and you don't have to wait forever to do that. And that would be, that would be a worthy calling. In fact, Winston Churchill, it's interesting, uh, you know, famous prime minister, um, they, they had an editor come in toward the end of his life and said, hey, you know, we're going to write a book about you, and, and, and I just want to double check the list of people that you know, had the greatest influence on your life, and gave him a list, and, and Winston Churchill was kind of a salty character, and he ripped up the list in front of them and threw it, threw it down the floor and said, why is my mom not on this list? She's the most influential person in my life. You know, and Abraham Lincoln, famous Abe, Abe Lincoln, he, he said, I have felt my mother's prayers all of my adult life. And so, so you can see that there's a powerful mother image in all this. In fact, we're going to end up seeing in just a few minutes that who saves the day is a, is a stay-at-home mom, is, is, is the woman that God uses with her ordinary means to bring justice and fulfill God's mission. But before that, we've got to pick on the guys just a little bit. So let's go uh, to Lipidoth first. Let's just lap it off. Um, if you go to him, he's found again in verse 4, and it says this. Now Deborah, a prophetess, the wife of Lapidoth, was judging Israel at that time. Now, Lapidoth is the greatest guy in this chapter. The other guys, we're going to pick on him. But then, Lapidoth is like, he's the unsung hero in this chapter. And, and what this means is that somehow he was a man who commended and cultivated his wife so much that she could flourish. And the question is, men, are we, are you, are we, cultivating our wives and are they flourishing under our leadership? And most guys just go, "Uh uh-huh, yeah, she is. It's like, (laughs) probably not, right? It's like, she's like, you know, kneeing you right now and elbowing you. It's like, probably not. Um, Well, maybe, and you know, it's like, we're not all doing terrible at this, but but one question that you'd ask is, okay, well, what are my wife's gifts? And wives can ask that question about their husbands as well, but that's a good question to ask. What What would be my wife's gifts? And it's like, well, if you have no idea what her gifts are, it's like, well, what would she like to do? What would be her desires? How would she like to flourish? What would she like to develop it? It's like, if you can't even answer those questions, then obviously she's probably, it's okay. We all very need to grow on, but she's probably not flourishing under your leadership. Um, you know, most people, it's funny, whenever it's time to date or, or court or, or dort or whatever, you know, we want to call that, um, everybody gets, and I, you know, and I remember this, everybody gets really excited about Proverbs 31. We read Proverbs 31, and, and the women go, I want to be a Proverbs 31 woman. Oh, that's awesome, you know. And then the guys read it and go, that was, I mean, that's the kind of woman I want to be married to. Well, what, what people don't realize is the Proverbs 31 woman has a Proverbs 31 husband. He's actually in it. You read Proverbs 31 before you go to bed at night, you're like, at the very end, it's like, and her husband is the leader and sits at the gates with the elders and leaders to discuss things. And you're like, oh, she's married to a great man. She's married to a mature, godly man who is investing in her and caring for her. In fact, it's been said by many that, and it's it's a humbling thing, that that the measure of a man's leadership is the flourishing countenance on his wife's face. And and I heard one guy say this. He said, you know, and that's that's why, the guy was telling me this. He goes, that's true. He goes, and that's why I always watch the wife's face when the preacher's preaching. 
And I was like, you're never invited to our church ever, okay? <laughs> you know, because it's intimidating, right? Um, but we see Lapidoth, and he's a great example, but then we see Barak, and Barak is, is the temptation of every man. Look at verse 6. So she sends to Barak, actually look at verse 8. And Barak, so she goes to Barak, she does the right thing, she encourages him with God's word. She challenges him. And then Barak says this, Barak said, if you will go with me, I will go. In other words, he, he is cowardly and wants conditional obedience. Very, very common. Uh, yeah, 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 we'll, we'll start giving money when we make X amount of money. Yeah, 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 we'll be sexually pure once we get married. Uh, you know, let me put a bunch of uh, other restrictions on what God has said, and when these things happen, then I'm going to obey God. When, when it's easy, I will obey God. That's what he's saying. But if you will not go with me, I will not go. And she said, and I think with a massive sigh, like, oh, okay, <laughs> you know, I will surely go with you. Nevertheless, the road on which you are going will not lead to your glory. You missed your opportunity to take responsibility. Responsibility and opportunity are almost the identical same thing. It's like, well, you missed it. Now you're not going to get the glory. For the Lord will sell Sisera into the hand of a woman. I used to think that was Deborah. It's actually Jael we're going to see in a few minutes. Then Deborah arose and went to Barak, went with Barak to Kadesh. And Barak called out Zebulun and Naphtali to Kadesh. And 10,000 men went up at his heels, and Deborah went up with him. So here's a great temptation that Barak kind of shows us. It's, it's the temptation of men to avoid and abandon their responsibilities. Now, now most men are thankfully not reckless enough to completely abandon all their responsibilities. I mean, that happens occasionally. Men are just like, you know what? All the kids and all this, I'm out of here. And they just leave. And they, they actually v literally, visibly, tangibly, tangibly abandon. But what most men settle for is, is something more like avoiding responsibility. And it kind of works like this. It's like, well, you know, my wife will raise, raise the kids and handle all that stuff. It's like, no, 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 you will help her. It's like, well, no, no, the school will educate my kids. No, you're going to educate your kids primarily. It's like you can send them to public school or private school or charter school or whatever, magnet school or whatever, but you're going to take primary responsibility for your kids. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, the, the kids ministry will disciple my kids. No, you'll disciple your kids. The kids ministry will come alongside and affirm and resource you and help you in any way possible. And we live in a culture, partly because of all of our modern conveniences, where we feel like, well, what we can actually do is we can just avoid our responsibility and then have everybody else do everything for us. And so, well, how do, how do you change it? Well, you have to just, it's not simple. It, well, it's, it's not easy. It's simple. You've got to say, I'm going to take responsibility for everything that happens in my home. And I can no longer say, not fair or not my fault. Those, those, if you're going to be the head of the home and lead, you can never say that's not fair or it's not my fault. You've got to say, well, okay, maybe it's not my fault but it's still my responsibility. And, and it's hard, you know, and sometimes it's humbling, and we'll talk about this in a couple weeks, sometimes it's humbling at the first steps you have to take. So I, I got a phone call about two weeks ago from, from a gentleman in our church. Real, you know, he's just started attending, he's got a young family, he's very, very excited, there's lots of people like that. And, uh, and he calls me, and he says, hey, I mean, he just starts, he's excited, he just starts telling me a bunch of stuff on the phone. And he says, you know, I, since coming to Two Cities Church, da -da 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 -da, and he says, and I just want to be, he says, I just want to be a better spiritual leader. And he said, but life's, and I can write this, he goes, but life's crazy, and my kids are crazy, and you know, my, we got a good marriage, but it's just a lot going on, and my, my job's kind of crazy, and it's hard to make enough money, and da 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 and, and he said, and I'm just trying to be a good spiritual leader. He said, so the other day, we're, we're leaving, we're heading out the door. And, and I just said to the family, I said, guys, let's pray. He said, I've never, never done that. He said, I said, let's just pray, I'm going to pray out loud. And so he said, all the kids, you know, they, they kind of bow their heads or whatever, or they close their eyes, and he said, close your eyes, you know, because, and um, he's... <laughs> He prays over them, and he says, I don't know if it was a good prayer, and it was a short prayer, and it might not even be a theologically accurate prayer, and I, you know, whatever, and, it was, and we were all crazy, and the kids were everywhere, and, but I prayed over them, and then I had to leave because, you know, it's going to be late, and so he left, and, and he said about three or four hours later, his wife texted him and said, that was awesome. Like, that was, thank you for, try, you know, for, for stepping up and for, for, for leading our family and, and for praying over us, and I think you see two things in that story. Number one, you, you see that, that a guy is, is trying. Right, he, he's stepping out, he's saying, well, you know, it's, it's, sometimes it's humbling. It's like, well, this is what I have to do. I've, I've never prayed out loud, so now I have to try this. It's like, the guy is like, I've never prayed with my wife, and we've been married for 10 years, and this is awkward. Well, it's okay, we'll get over it. It will be less awkward, you know, in, in a year from now when you keep doing these things. Um, but it will be, it's like, well, you just, you know, what's the alternative? You never pray? It's like, you don't want that. So, so you have to kind of humble yourself. But then what's interesting is, is, is what's beautiful is the way that the wife responds. See, see what happens a lot of times is, and it, I, I'm sure it goes both ways. But what I, what I see a lot of times is, is finally a man steps up and says, like, that's it. We're going to do devotions to the family. I'm going to pray. We're going to pray. 
And then the wife says something foolish like, you're just doing that because you heard a sermon on it. The only reason you're doing it right now is because Kyle said that. Oh, now you're doing it. Or then, even worse, then they do it. That wasn't a very good devotional. Why would you read that book? And, and here's what happens. It's, it's, it's actually very evil, and let me explain why. Um, Nietzsche, who I don't often quote for various reasons, okay? <laughs> you're like, Nietzsche? Yeah. Well, he was actually a really smart guy, but in some ways. And what he said was, he said, if you really want to punish somebody, you don't punish them when they do something wrong. Because they'll thank you later. They'll say, well, that was really dumb. I mean, maybe it took me a couple years, but that was really dumb. Thank you for punishing me, and I learned my lesson. He said, if you really want to punish somebody, you punish them when they do something right. And that's what happens a lot of times. Somebody, you know, uh, somebody steps up and they say, well, you know, I'm going to try to pray. And then the wife says that was terrible and that was too short. And it's like, well, you do that two or three times and he'll never pray. It, it absolutely crushed somebody's spirit. So this is how we, ha we have to learn to work together. The men have to learn how to encourage the women. The women have to learn how to encourage the men. Um, <clears throat> so that's Barak. The, the, the final guy that we look at is a guy named Sisera, and he's found in, in, in verse 12. Here's what it says about him. When Sisera, and he's kind of the man's man of the day. This guy is like army general, four star, you know, just, he's a man's man. Um, when Sisera was told that Barak, the son of Abinamum, had gone to Mount Tabor, Sisera called out all his chariots. Remember, he had 900. 900 chariots of iron. So he's got lots of power. He's got lots of pleasure. He's got lots of possessions. He's like your quintessential guy. Um, and all the men who were with him, and a lot of people respect him and follow him. From Harasheth to the river of Kishon. And Deborah said to Barak, up, for this is the day in which the Lord has given Sisera into your hand. Does not the Lord go out before you? So Barak went down from Mount Tabor with 10,000 men following him. And the Lord routed Sisera. Now we get to see the, the sovereignty of God in this. And the Lord routed Sisera and all his chariots and all his army before Barak by the edge of the sword. And Sisera got down from his chariot and fled away on foot. And Barak pursued the chariots and the army of Harasheth. And all the army of Sisera fell by the edge of the sword. Not a man was left. And we get a little bit more of the story. We're going to see in a moment how Sisera's life ends. But if you go to chapter 5, verse 28, in the song of Deborah and Barak, we get a little bit more about Sisera that, that, that kind of lets us know the kind of man he was. And it's, it's through a song that mocks his mom. Here's what it says. Out of the window she peered, the mother of Sisera. So the images of, of Sisera's mom looking for him to return home from war. That's the image. Um, out of the window she peered, the mother of Sisera wailed through the lattice. Why is his chariot so long in coming? Why tarry the hoofbeats of his chariots? Her wisest princes an princesses answer. Indeed, she answers herself. Have they not found and divided the spoil? So he was a man who took from others. He was a taker. And then, it's kind of softer worded here, but it says a womb, for, a womb or two for every man. In other words, he would defile and disrespect and rape the women in those towns as well. So this is like a bad man. Um, it says this, a womb, for, a womb or two for every man, spoiled, spoil of dyed material for Sisera, spoil of dyed materials embroidered, two pieces of dyed work embroidered for the neck as a spoil. In other words, and he liked and had really nice stuff. Here's the second temptation of, of men. Instead of abandoning and avoiding their responsibilities, they abuse their strengths. So it's like, well, you know, it's like, well, why did God make men strong in, in many different men, dimensions? I mean, well, God made men strong so that they would be givers, not takers, so that they would be contributors, not consumers. But see, everything in our culture tells us that what men should, what makes a man a man is what he consumes. It's like, well, you know, you, that's what marketing and advertising. It's like, well, drink this beer and you'll be a man. And guys go, okay, you know, eat these, eat these chicken wings and you'll be a man. You know, wear this flannel shirt and you'll be a man. You know, uh, buy this beard oil and you'll be a man. You know, and guys go, oh, well, that sounds good. I'd like to be a man. I don't know what it is. And, and marketing comes in and says, this is what a man is. Versus the Bible says a man is not what he consumes. A man is uh, the responsibility he takes in how he gives to other people. And so what we end up seeing here is Sisera is going to end up being judged by God through a woman. This is what's going to be called retributive justice. In other words, because you defiled women, you actually be judged by a woman. And let's pick that story up in, uh, chapter, or in verse 17 of chapter 4. But Sisera fled away on foot to the tent of Jael. Now here's the stay-at-home mom. And she, she's working on a tent. This is like, um, 
So she, it was very common for the stay-at-home moms to, to keep track of the tents, to move the tent pegs. It was a nomadic, they would move. And, and so it was the woman's job uh, for various reasons to take it down and to reset it up. So she was very good with a hammer. She was very good uh, with, the tent, with the tent and the tent pegs. It would be, I mean, to her, it would be everyday, ordinary materials and tools that she was using. And here's what it says. Um, he went on foot to the tent of Jael. Now, so now we see the sovereignty of God again in leading this guy. The wife of Heber the Kenite. For there was peace between Jabin and the king of Hazar in the house of Heber the Kenite. Verse 18. And Jael came out to meet Sisera and said to him, Turn aside, my lord, turn aside to me. Do not be afraid. So he turned aside to her into the tent, and she covered him with a rug. And he said to her, Please give me a little water to drink, for I am thirsty. So she opened a skin of milk and gave him a drink and covered him. And he, said, and he said to her, stand at the opening of the tent, and if any man asks, is there anyone here, say no. So now we see that he's also a liar, which is what many men do to cover up their sins. Instead of repenting, they lie about it. Verse 21, but Jael, and you almost read this, you go, wow, I can't believe this is in the Bible. Um, but Jael, the wife of Heber, took a tent peg and took a hammer in her hand, and she went softly to him and drove the peg into his temple until it went down into the ground while he was lying fast asleep from weariness. And then these three words, yeah, you think? So he died. <laughs> and she said, nailed it! <laughs> and behold, as Barak was pursuing Sisera, Jael went out to meet him and said to him, Come, and I will show you the man whom you are seeking. So, she, so he went into her tent, and there lay Sisera dead with a tent peg in his temple. You know, one of the interesting things about this story is how God ultimately deals justly with sinful people. That's it. You go, well, that was amazing, because he has to get out of his uh, you know, chariot, and then he's got to run to this area, and then he's got to go into this tent, and then this woman ends up, ends up taking his life. And the, the whole idea here, is that God will ultimately pay every, every person back for their sins. That, that's kind of the, the principle. That, uh, that all, or let me say it even better than that, all sin will ultimately be paid for and taken care of. And you go, well, well what? You know, some people read these stories and they go, you know, they're very violent and, and, and I'm afraid this is gonna make Christians violent. But if you actually understand all of scripture, what you realize is in, uh, that when Jesus Christ comes, he doesn't come to take life, but to give his life. He doesn't pierce anybody else, but he lets himself be pierced for us. And so what you can do is you can look and go, okay, how does God deal with sin? How is God a just God today? How do we know that God deals with every sin? Because God tells us that he will deal with every sin either at the cross of Christ or in hell forever. And that actually helps you deal with the people that have sinned against you and to forgive them. If, if a brother or sister in Christ forget, sins against you, guess what? It was paid for at the cross. And if somebody who's not in Christ, um, you know, uh, sins against you, you realize that, that that's either going to be paid for at the cross if they repent and believe, or it was paid for, it will be paid for by them in hell. And therefore, you can say, vengeance is not mine, justice is not mine, it's the Lord's. And it actually allows you to be a humble servant person. So, so, so in response, look what they say. I want you to look real quickly at verse 24 in the song of chapter 5, verse 24, what they sing about Jael. This is amazing. So, so they're singing about the, what, what just happened. They're celebrating the victory of God, and they say this, most blessed of women be Jael. And some of you from a Catholic background go, I heard that before. <laughs> because it's the only other woman in the Bible to be called most blessed. Jael and Mary. In fact, it's repeated. The wife of Heber the Kenite, of tent-dwelling women most blessed. In other words, God wants to use every type of woman in his mission. Whether it's the Deborah, and you've got a public ministry, uh, whether, it's, whether you've got some great teaching gifts, whether you're a stay-at-home mom who's using her normal appliances for the mission and vision of God, God wants to use every woman, and we want every woman in this church on mission, sharing their faith, making disciples, investing in the next generation. Now to the men, it's like men need to realize how much their lives matter. Like, like, like think about this for a second. They say that if, <clears throat> if the child in a family is the first to come to faith in Christ, so, you know, there's a family, the child's the first to come to faith in Christ. The chances that the rest of the family comes to faith in Christ and becomes Christians, 3%. Unfortunately, not very high. Well, it's like, well, then they, they did another study. They said, well, what, what, now if a mom comes to faith in Christ, if a mom or the wife comes to faith in Christ, what is the chance that the whole rest of the family is going to come to faith in Christ? 
17%. And you go, well, that's great. Well, it's, a, it's a lot better than three. Um, and, but it's still not as high as you think. And then they said, well, what, what happens if a husband or a father comes to faith in Christ in that family? What is the percentage chance that everyone else in that family comes to faith in Christ? The answer, 93%. So don't let anyone ever say that men don't have a, have a massive influence in their home. That men can't be used by God in the lives of other people. What we need to learn how to do, kind of in summary, is we need to learn how to serve one another. We need to learn how to encourage one another. We need to learn how to pray for one another. We need to learn how um, to use our gifts and our different roles and responsibilities as relate in the body. See, see I, what, what's taught on the college campus today, what's taught in the media today, and it's a lie. It, there, there's a narrative that's told. It's a narrative of, of, of what's happened over the last, let's say, 10,000 years. It's like, and the narrative goes something like this. Women have always been oppressed by men. That's the narrative. That's the narrative you'll be told if you go to Wake Forest. That's the narrative that you're told if you go to UNC. That women have always been oppressed by men. It's like, that's a lie. That is a lie. What that does is that creates an oppression mindset. It's, a, it's an ideology of resentment. Listen, Everybody was oppressed by nature until about 150 years ago. Life was so hard for everybody until about 150 years ago. And what have men and women tried to do? They've tried to get along, for the most part. It's like, yeah, you, well, yeah, women stayed home for a long time. Yeah, and men fought all the wars. It's like it was hard on everybody. And we have this, we're in, we live in this culture today where it's like, it's like they're trying to divide us up by this group's against this group, and then this group's against this group, and then men versus women, and women versus men. It's like, we want to be the church that says, look, we're, we're both made equally in God's image. God's made us with different roles and responsibilities. We're both created to encourage and flourish, and we were designed to work together. Let's be that type of church. Pray with me. Lord, that's our prayer. Lord, we thank you for Jesus Christ who deals with every sin. All the sins that have been that we have committed, the sins that have been committed against us, Lord. Lord, we thank you for the example. Lord, I thank you for raising up examples for us to see. We we need people to model. We need we need good and bad examples. Lord, I thank you for the example of Deborah. Lord, I pray for the women uh, in our church to to know your word and to teach it. Lord, I pray that they would make disciples. Lord, Lord, I, I pray for the women in our church that that they would particularly invest in the next generation of women. I pray that there would be a value in our church, yes, for the, for the working person and all that, but, but especially for the mom. And Lord, we pray for the men that we would not uh, abandon or avoid our responsibility or abdicate it, Lord, uh, that we would not abuse any strengths that we have, Lord, but we would use it to serve you and to serve others. Lord, I pray that our church would be a salty and bright example of what it, looks for men, for, look, what it looks like for men and women to love and serve one another. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.